And for our point where either the left can fully put its efforts behind the Labour Party, because this is a once in a lifetime opportunity, or Actually, is this a situation where statecraft is inherently reactionary and it's something we should avoid at all costs and we should be making the most of this fertile environment in other ways? So, to help me answer this question, I have Ash. Oh, is this working? Oh, here we go. I've got Ash Sarkar, last anarchist left in London, um, <laughs> and senior editor at Navarra Media. I have Ewa Yazovic, a woman who puts us all to shame because you've organised on things ranging from anti-capitalism to unions, to the environment and everything in between. I have Mika Minio, an, an energy economist who provides the Labour Party on industrial strategy of public ownership. And I've got Mary Goodfellow, writer and researcher working primarily on gender, race and migration. And I'm Kirsty Major. And I work at the Indy. So first of all, I'd like us to sort of answer the question, what is the left? And what are our aims? And then secondly, how does the Labour Party engage with them? So Ava, would you like to start? I guess I have to. <laughs> <laughs> what is the left? What is the left? No one can answer that question. <laughs> um, as someone who's never Really seen as Actually, a big part of the left. I'm, I'm, you're, you're not the only anarchist left in London. <laughs> I am still part of it. But did you join the Labour Party? No. Uh -huh. Okay, I did. So you are. You are. So <laughs> um, <laughs> I guess the left is a bit of an assemblage of, um, at the moment, people who've been active and organising for many, many years, who maybe started out in the Labour Party, then left. Um, during the Tony Blair years and around the Iraq war and have now come back into it. And I'm not really going to speak for them. I guess I can speak a bit for the people who wouldn't really be in this room and who aren't going to join the Labour Party and are feeling quite critical of the whole project. And they would be people from you know, anarchist movement, direct action, grassroots organising movement that have been doing anti-fascist work, who've been organizing social centers, um, squatting properties for, for their own needs, but also around creating social centers, solidarity centers, um, doing work with refugees, and grassroots trade union organizing as well. Um, I'm a member of United Voices of the World, and I've been doing a bit of training work with them, and I feel like this is the sort of orientation that is most important and that Labour can learn from and, tr and the main trade unions can learn from as well, because it's a, it's a union that is organizing around a community and, and workplace model. And much of the work is focused on migrant workers, cleaners, and it's about empowering them and enabling them to represent themselves rather than it usually, as is the case in mainstream unions, of being a uh, white male bureaucrat. Not, not necessarily a bad person or someone without experience from the shop floor, but not really um, a genuine representative of the people at a grassroots level. And I think that Labour as a party is trying to rectify this, but still, it's, it takes, it's still quite an unrepresentative party in many ways um, of the people, of, of working class people in this country, both, both British citizens and uh, migrant workers, migrants living here who are going to be severely impacted by Brexit. And I've got to say, Labour's policy on Brexit, because I just wrote a chapter about this, is shit. <laughs> it's, you mentioned the B word. I thought we'd... <laughs> Maybe at least get five minutes before we got there. Okay. <laughs> Just briefly, um, I think we have to be really strong on this. Um, this whole, the whole arguments around um, freedom of movement and, and trying to put constraints on that through. Um, engaging in, in, a, in a way of, of classifying migrants and buying into this kind of um, migrant visa system. There's already over 30 different visas in this country that classify people, but the, the recommendations that are part of the Labour Manifesto around um, having controlled migration and feeding into this, this system is actually a fragmentation and a fracturing of the working class in this country and will absolutely ferment more of a black market um, around employment and also a lot, more, a lot more racism. So I think it's very important to be clear about not buying into that. I know some of the big unions have talked about 
um, having quotas for migrant workers in workplaces only where there's a recognition agreement. This is a fantasy. Um, most workplaces aren't covered by a union recognition agreement, but even if they were, that would turn unions into effectively border guards, checking workers' papers and visas. And this is important because this is how class is made. It's literally made through classification and subordination of different peoples through economic uh, subordination and, and, and oppressive means. And Brexit in particular is, is going to be like a turbocharging of this process if we're not vigilant about it and if we're not standing and organizing with the most precarious workers, both British and migrant. So um, I think that's what <laughs> needs to happen. <laughs> that wasn't an answer to the question, but uh, <laughs> so what I was thinking about. Ash, can you build on any of that, especially around freedom of movement? I mean, I think, I think, well, first let's take this question of who are the left. Because 40 years ago, 50 years ago, that was a really easy question to answer. There were some quite well-established organizational forms. You have a very strong union presence, and you also had a very authoritarian, bureaucratic, but actually existing socialism and communism. So you had all these things to orient yourself or to disidentify yourself, but there was something solid. In the intervening wilderness period, recognizing that that antagonism in terms of freedom of movement, in terms of it racialized precarious classes of worker and saying, well, that's something that's always been there, leads us to, I think, a productive step of saying, in histories of resistance and subversion of counter power have also always been there. So 
I feel intensely optimistic for once. Maybe I'm just in a particularly happy spoke in my hormonal cycle. But I think that there is room for a kind of constructive antagonism with the Labour Party on this question of whether or not it's a vehicle for radical leftism. Because I think that for the first time in my living memory, there's a real chance and a kind of like taste of a possibility of meaningful political change on the horizon. Thank you. Maya, you've been constructively antagonistic toward the Labour Party of late. Um, what are your thoughts? Yes, yeah, so I think... Uh, oh, is this on? Is it? Curse of the mic. Oh, it's like one side of it that works, that side. <laughs> this side? Yeah. Okay. Okay, um, so I actually think, thinking about this question, something that Stuart Hall would encourage us all to do would be to think about the particular moment we're living in um, and why we're having this conversation at this particular time. So I think recognising, and this is something that I think we are continuing to do, but does at times get lost in the debate, recognising exactly what has occurred over the past two years is incredibly important to think about how we engage with that as we move forward. And what we've actually seen, I don't think it was just the general election that was kind of the shift of the um, political landscape, as we've kind of been told that it was. What we actually saw was two years of the Labour Party trying to plug away with Jeremy Corbyn as leader to shift the debate. Um, and what that achieved, really, was a sense that this, the withered, I think, moribund status quo that we'd been told was the only option was no longer the only option. And that's what we all, we all know, and that's what we've all understood from the general election. Um, unfortunately, within the Labour Party, and I think that we need, to see, we need to see these debates both within the Labour Party and then people who are outside the Labour Party but on the left. Um, within the Labour Party, that's not, a, that's not a totally agreed upon point. And I think that what we need to continue to do within those structures then is to push that argument and push the argument that actually continuing down this path that Jeremy Corbyn has begun to forge is really essential to achieving not only this electoral success that is so crucial to winning these arguments within those Labour circles, but also achieving any kind of future that anyone of our age wants to be signed on to. But when we're doing that, I think what's really, really important for us when we're thinking about how we engage within labour spaces and out, outside of them, particularly for people who aren't engaging in, within those labour spaces, is recognising the history of the Labour Party. And I think that history shows us the real limitations. So this idea about race and migration being two key planks that the left, the, left, the party political left, has always historically been bad on. And what I think we need to be really, really careful of doing is there is, a, there is a retelling of that history that is incredibly false, even within those radical left Labour circles. This idea that the Labour Party was the party for equality, that it was the anti-racist party, that it was an internationalist party. When you actually dig down into the roots of what that internationalism means, it's incredibly vague, it's incredibly split. The Labour Party was an, not an anti-empire um, uh, pro, it didn't support the anti-colonial movements. Um, throughout the 50s and 60s. Um, and that actually, the reason why that is important is because that does continue to underpin the politics that we see today, as well as being some kind of, it's used, the false retelling of that history is used in a defensive way by the left within the Labour Party in a way that means they don't have to engage with that history themselves. They don't have to engage with the failures, the fail failures of the trade union movement, historically and in contemporary times, and the failures within those same leftist circles. We have individuals who may be doing very well on stuff like anti-racism. We have really important figures like Diane Abbott who I think need to be really supported and really cheered in these moments, um, like the general election. They do really good work, right? But they are people, they are individuals within a much broader structure. So I think that when, we, when we're talking about what is the left and where does the left go from here, we have to be incredibly critical of that history and we have to be honest about that history because to forge a new, um, a new Labour Party, but also a left that can engage with that Labour Party, there needs to be a really, really honest recognition of what the issues are. And the issues are predominantly race and migration. The left is not good on this. The, the manifesto, not only did it say, let's abandon freedom of movement, it also 
said no recourse to public funds for migrants. There was nothing about closing immigration detention centres, which is arguably a relatively easy policy to kind of to um, to include in the manifesto. So knowing that history, I think, is really important for all of us to begin to push the Labour Party and the left in conjunction with one another forward from where we are now. So Mika, you've been working with the la within the Labour Party, the, the belly of the beast. Um, what do you think the issues are that the left needs to take to Labour? Um, I, guess, I guess for context, I'm... I, I'm the chair of my local branch, and I've also been doing various advice for, uh, for Corbyn's team and for Labour Centre. I think, though, before directly answering that bit, we sh like the left isn't static at all. The left is constantly shifting. Right? Having this many people in the room for this topic would not have happened two years and three months ago, and probably lots of you here two years and three months ago were not part of a mobilised left. Maybe everybody was. There's no, lots just, of faces I don't know. <laughs> like, there weren't that many of us three years ago. <laughs> so <clears throat> I think we should recognize that shuff, stuff is concentrated. Now, the institutions, lots of them are pretty, like, you know, they take longer to adapt. But even so, I mean, you know, Navarro came out of nowhere. Like, lots of things. Like, spring up, momentum. And, and movements are also constantly adapting. And it's, it's messy within that. And... We shouldn't think of labor as too static in that context. That labor carries masses of baggage, masses of like being front and center in imperialism over a lot of the last 60 years. And that needs to be unpacked. And especially in the context of like there's a big argument in labor at the moment about how to talk about Englishness. And, and that's like <laughs> clearly lots of that is not they're, not, they're not doing anything towards recognizing Labour's role in a violent, oppressive Englishness. At the same time, it's quite easy for people in London to go, yeah, whatever, let's not think about Englishness. I'm fine being British, because actually most people, lots of people in London, I mean, there's lots of us who don't like thinking about Britishness or Englishness and recognize yeah, both of them. Yeah, some of us wrote for Palmer's Green, okay. <laughs> but there are lots of people who think of themselves and are on the hard left, who are happy of Britishness, not happy of Englishness, and don't bother thinking, don't bother engaging with what are the arguments outside London. So I think we do need to challenge ourselves as the radical left to go, okay, what does that mean in Leeds? What does that mean in Hull? What does that mean in Yarmouth? Because being radical, I totally agree, obviously, radical is about ultimately the roots. It's about dismantling the roots. But it's quite the conception of what is radical here can look quite different to the conception of what's radical in Yarmouth. I think also in terms of what needs to be fed into the heart of labor at this point, and coming from a background very much being like an anarchist who was on the street, like mostly on the streets, like that's not, that's the, whether it was in the Egyptian revolution or in other places, like that was for me where struggle was. We, we were going to win. Like The last time I felt this close to us seizing power was because the Ministry of the Interior in Egypt was 50 meters down the road and only two more lines of cops in between us and it and we'd already got through five. So it's like, okay, we're going to take it. <coughs> but ultimately, the thing that beat the movements there, I don't want to say us because I could leave, um, wasn't the cops and it wasn't the tanks. It was that we didn't have they didn't have, the movements didn't have enough of a vision of what we wanted. Lots of strong arguments on resistance. Lots of strong arguments, like lots of, it was very clear that Mubarak was gone, that that had to end, that the corruption was, had to end. But what we want, what people wanted was much harder. And I think that we need to keep pushing ourselves not to just say no. And to go, well, okay, what are those things that we are going to fight for and that's a lot harder. Some of it, yeah, obviously we need to shut the detention centers. But uh, the practical stuff, like on councils, we could theoretically have seized, as the left, we could have seized most of London next, next May, June. Like the hard left were in Labour, if we'd been better organized, could have won lots of the councillor selections, got through. It would have been tricky, but we could have won more. But we'd actually have to have a plan for what we want to do, because otherwise we'll just end up like the shit progress ones. Like, you know, we might be a little bit better, 
We might stop sending social workers to harass sex workers. Don't say that name on this stage, thank you. <laughs> I'll stop there. Um, so we've spoken a lot about the limitations of labour, but I want to pose a question. Are these problems particular to the Labour Party as an institution, or are these problems inherent to the idea of statecraft, the idea that all electoral, electoral politics are essentially about compromise, and that's where these issues are coming from? Ewa, do you want to start? Um, yeah, I mean, I, it would be good to see where else people have managed to legislate for the best kind of conditions that allow for social movements to make gains and to breathe and to, to evolve. Um, I don't know of that many examples, to be quite honest. Maybe Barcelona, but I'm, I'm not informed enough to talk about that. But... If we're looking at some of the legislative changes that we want to see with Labour winning, they're not going to be able to be pushed through unless we have a majority in Parliament. So there is a necessity for candidates to come forward and stand as councillors, and then councillors, not, not necessarily has to happen this way, but we need more radical MPs to make those, those decisions and changes and, and represent our interests in a forum which is going to create that structural... It's obviously not going to create... like structural change in terms of social reproduction because there's so much cultural work to be done to dismantle already such a, a racist and repressive culture that we have. But some of the, the changes that are going to lessen the economic damage that people are suffering on a daily basis, so repeal of the trade union, anti-union anti laws, should you know, enable workers and unions to, to fight for more within the workplace, but because of neoliberal culture, most people don't know what a trade union is and are still thinking in quite individualized ways. So, you know, that, that work at the top needs to be matched by a lot of organizing from below at a grassroots level, at a workplace level and a community level to actually really educate and um, skill people up in how to organize at work. You know, if we get rid of these laws, okay, we're, we're free to, to strike easier, we're going to be free to... Um, you know, we're not going to have zero hours contracts. We're, we're going to get rid of unscrupulous, or all of them, employment agencies. We're going to have, you know, more of an open field to organise in. But if we don't know how to organise, and, we, you know, we're still working in a context where a lot of our co-workers are speaking five different languages, you know, you need, you need organisations, good unions, that are going to put time and money and effort into having meetings where you've got all the translators present and you've got you know, a, a way of organising, and also an orientation which is explicitly anti-capitalist. Um, that's, that's got to happen. So, I mean, repealing the trade union laws is one example, but also creating the conditions for community-owned renewable energy and getting rid of the big six and, and reforming the whole energy system, which Mika can, can speak very clearly about. Um, also repealing some of the most, you know, how do, we, how do we abolish prisons? How do we get rid of, um, you know, indefinite uh, detention, well, detention centres, but also um, the public protection indefinite sentencing? Like, there's a whole architecture of, of repression that has been created to, to contain um, some of the, the responses to the, the repressive, impoverishing, racist, misogynist kind of anti-working class environment that we have in this country that's developed over, you know, forever, but intensely over the last 30 years, those need to be dismantled. And the Tory press and the establishment are going to have a fit about that. But these are some of the structures that are going to, that need to be undone, you know, because we can't just have more decent kind of legislative conditions that are palatable to mainstream society. We need to support people who are imprisoned, who are in detention centers, who are in precarious work, who, you know, are needing refuge, fleeing domestic violence. You know, we need, we need to really focus in these areas. And, you know, all kind of structural changes through legislation should be orientated around that and explicitly culturally explaining why it's important to, to change the laws around that and put massive funding into these, these areas and these services. I think there's so much healing that needs to happen in this country. So I think we should, yeah. And Awa, do you feel like you can dismantle these structures from within the state or outside of it? Because it's almost like you, you, know, you inherit all of these things, like some sort of ugly couch from your nan when you get into state, like prisons and detention centres. And actually, it's the, you know, it's the civil service and, and other various structures super protective of them. And 
do you have to be outside of it to make that happen? I think you need, you know, there's, there are people who are organizing and campaigning and, and doing this work at a, at a community level. I think, you know, the discourse from the top in like PMQs and in the kind of, um, you know, in the kind of statements that are going to be made from, from the front bench of the Labour Party need to, need to sound more, more radical, perhaps. And if they can't, they need to be more open to what's coming from, from the grassroots. So wh when I think about what the Labour Party can do in a structural kind of representative, legislative sense, that's, that's quite technical. And the social movement aspect is going to be as good as the councillors and the MPs at a local level and the organising that goes on to put pressure to hold them to account if people are going to follow that line and have faith. Because, you know, I've done community organising in Newham and I'm doing some union organising in Newham. This is a rotten borough with a solid Labour council. It's like an anti-council. They're doing, they're like a model for neoliberalism in this country in terms of social cleansing, um, you know, new housing developments, unaffordable housing and um, academisation of schools. You know, there, there are people in Newham who will never trust the Labour Party, who just spit on the Labour Party and with good reason. So, where, you know, work needs to be done there. Um, people need to regain the faith there, but I think at all stages and at, at all times, we can't we can't give away our power to representatives. Like we can, they can represent us, they, they can support us, but I think you have to keep pushing and organising. And your your strength is is in the community and in your union. I mean, I think that there's a problem in assuming that um, statecraft as a technology hasn't changed. I think that it has changed drastically in the last few decades. We've moved from um, structures of discipline to structures of control. So there's big in disciplinary institutions that we associate with the oppressive state have largely been scaled back or privatized. And what we have is a kind of, oh, I'm so pretentious and I'm so sorry for doing this. We have the kind of like permeation of governmentality, right? a kind of logic of control that we've internalized and carry with us everywhere, which suits the, kind, the demands of atomized existences under neoliberalism. So I think that when we're talking about a critique of statecraft, if we're not you know, coupling with that, a critique of how we have our own neoliberal subjectivities, then it's a debate that's stuck somewhere in the you know, 60s or 70s. As for, shit, as for the limitations of statecraft, like, this is why I love white people. Because you lot think that you have invented political dilemmas, right? The Black Panthers were dealing with what is the nature of non-reformist reform way back when, right? When you want to look at how do you use um, a takeover of a municipal government to start implementing abolitionist aims, well, they done been doing that already. And these are just histories that we choose not to listen to or engage with. And I think that looking at that kind of neighborhood organizing, and I think looking to that kind of neighborhood organizing as a counterpoint to that kind of progressive patriotism, nationalistic model that's being floated in some uh, corners of the Labour Party, I think is really um, quite fertile ground to building um, a people versus power block that can encompass everyone from like, Rago anarchos to you know self-identifying moderates or even the odds like you know socially liberal Tory, you know because we have to think about because yeah I think you rightly identified you know false histories in the Labour Party but we also need to think about how storytelling is a really powerful tool for shaping a social majority that can build a counter hegemony and make power stick. It's not just about winning an election; it's about changing the culture. And I think that one of the ways in which we can do that is rather than, I think, opposing statecraft, electoralism to social movements, so I do think we need to think really deeply about what a social movement independent of the Labour Party looks like, I think we need to start thinking about political terrains. And I think a really fertile political terrain is what does it mean to reclaim urban space? Because I'm thinking, when I was listening to you talk of those um, de-territorial support group posters of Beauty is in the Street, I love those posters. And it chimes with that feeling of possibility and affection and love that you get when you're just like pouring into a line of cops with like 20 of your mates, right? There's nothing like it. But that's not sustainable, right? You get burnt out, you get 
bruised, you get nicked, you get disheartened. And it's no substitute for the kinds of ownership of the streets when you have, when you can say, I don't know, afford to live in a neighborhood. And so I think we need to make that kind of, you know, municipal demand that comes from turning on the faucet, right? So Clay Davis, turn on the faucet in a while. You're looking at me blank. Um, you know, turn on the money faucet, um, which means that we can kind of transform uh, the kind of funding available for social housing and, real, and couple it with those insurrectionist demands of what's it look like to have ownership of the streets, right? Not just to think about a kind of top-down bureaucratic project of there's more housing, there you go, now live in it, but thinking about shaping that urban terrain. And I think that there are some wonderful thinkers who write really well on this. I think David Harvey is, um, you know, primus inter pares in that regard. And I think that these are thinkers that we should all be looking to because... As great as Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell and Diane Abbott all are, and I rate them all in so many ways, they're not going to do our political thinking for us. Navarra isn't going to do your political thinking for you either, and that's probably for the best. Um, I think all of us have a responsibility to get out and recover these counter-histories of counter-hegemonic strategy and start thinking about how we can implement that in our day-to-day -day lives, because... Diane Abbott, she's sick, but she can't institute a counter-hegemony. She can't build a counter-hegemony. She can't make a culture, right? We can. And I think that that's got to be the direction of conversation. So statecraft, for or against? Uh, yeah, I mean, I agree with what Ash was saying, so I'm going to maybe look at this in a slightly different way. And I think that's something that we need to be... Uh, if we just... But to momentarily think about it in terms of the Labour Party, just thinking about the Labour Party, if you get a Labour government, right, there are limitations in terms of what I've spoken about already, in terms of internal feuding, um, recognising that you have to... We've, we've already seen, right, we've already seen the kind of... Um, the things that Jeremy Corbyn has had to give ground on because of the nature of the Labour Party's history, but also the nature of where power lies within the PLP that is shifting. But I think that when, when we get a Labour government, um, if we get a Labour government with Jeremy Corbyn as um, leader of the Labour Party, we will see the um, arms of the state kick into gear. We will see attempts at every turn to curb, to reduce what the Labour Party do, the options available to them. We already know the fear within what is called the establishment about what a Corbyn-led Labour government would look like. And I think what's really important in all of this is we've seen over the past two years a whole movement build um, around Corbyn. People have been really, really invigorated by what he has offered, by just what I would think is not even radical politics, what is a change to the status quo within the UK. It's not a huge shift away from it. It is, a, it is something of a challenge to it. Those people have been energised by Corbyn, but the reality of a, a, a Labour government is something quite different. And I think that readying those people, readying ourselves for what is to come and to realise that the pressure is going to have to be put on them, that is when this, the fight is going to begin over some of these issues. And one of the key things that I think we need to be doing now, which I think Ash has in part touched upon, is some of these big issues, like migration, for instance, I don't think, and please correct me if I'm wrong in the Q&A, but I don't think, having work, working in this area right now and speaking to people across the left and in, this, in the sector, I don't think the work has been done in terms of the intellectual groundwork when thinking about migration. If we want to have open borders, we're probably not going to have that tomorrow. We're probably not going to see a Labour government stand on that kind of platform, right? What policies can we even begin to implement or to suggest that can even make that a thinkable, a thinkable idea. Like, you're talking about the abolition of prisons as well. Like, what are, we, what are we doing on the left? And this is a question to you all, because I'm sure people are doing this work. What are we doing in terms of laying that intellectual groundwork, even laying those practical policy and possibilities? Because the left has for so long been kind of on the offensive and trying to, trying to battle itself or trying to... Um, attack the right, I think that we haven't always had the space to then build what would be termed radical policies. And that's where I think we have this moment and we have this space and that's how we should be using it as we go forward. Um, you s stole all my best lines. Always happens. Um, <coughs> 
It's interesting because uh, I lived in Oakland for a couple of years and I did, while I was there, I was quite involved in lots of prison abolitionist movements. And like, our posters were designed by the same person who designed the Black Panther posters. Like, there's a continuity in terms of the people who are, who are doing a lot of that organizing. And there's a continuity in terms of the communities who are having these debates. And even there, the argument on why we need prison abolition and what to do instead wasn't fully won. Like everybody agreed the cops can fuck off. You don't want them in your neighborhood. But how we actually run stuff without them was super contentious and super difficult and pretty violent. And I think that's partly where we as a radical left, we want prison abolition and we want open borders, but that's why I said the thing about, and we need to know what we want, like what, what that looks like. like how do we, because having prison abolition is really difficult. <laughs> it's not easy. <laughs> it's not just about opening the prisons. It's how you deal with hard shit. And I'm sure lots of people here will have been involved in groups where, where you're as a political group having to go, how do we deal with people being aggressive to each other, with violence within our movements, without engaging the police? How do we create justice? And it's hard. And those same issues apply for things like open borders, apply for stuff like energy. And like the default stuff that comes out there, like on community energy, the default stuff on community energy is neoliberal and useless, and there's just investors and people making lots of money. Now that's what's actually happening at the moment with almost all the community energy. <clears throat> now, that's not what we want as a radical left. We want like, energy that, where, that people control democratically. And I think that the stuff, a lot of it is about democracy. That we, like you were saying, obviously we can't rely on labor from the top down to give us democracy, like real, true, radical democracy. Part of that is about going, well, working out some different ideas on what it looks like. But more than that, it's about actually winning the arguments and building commitment and winning the mandate that it's not just us that want it, but actually generally people want prison abolition. And that's much, much harder. And that's also our responsibility because we can't, hey, Corbyn's not going to do that. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll say the other. May, may I come in on this point really briefly? Um, is that I think taking open borders as an example is that I think there's a really like reasonable framing for this and I think it's one that we've been quite cautious about deploying and that is the kind of integration of the internal border into our everyday lives so landlords checking immigration status doctors checking immigration status because of visa surcharges like and so on and so forth. I was chatting to a friend of mine who's a teacher because obviously schools are now collecting citizenship data. Even Tories will agree teachers shouldn't be doing that shit. And you can make that case about it is a gross violation of the rights of pupils or you can make this argument on the basis of efficiency, like, you know, teachers should be teaching your kid, like, you know, two plus two is four, minus one is three, quick maths, etc. Like... You know, and you can make that case, I think, in, in multiple ways. You should be building on some things that are already there. And I'm thinking about this more in terms of political narrative rather than structures. And I think that this is why we really need to go back to reading some histories of um, the birth of neoliberalism and the success of neoliberalism, because that was really the last big paradigm shift. And, I mean, everyone should read Stuart Hall anyway because he's fucking sick. But you really should read Stuart Hall and the Neoliberal Revolution because one of the things that he talks about is how Thatcher very effectively built on tropes that already existed within the political imagination, tweaked them, right, redefined them, gave, you know, more prominence to certain aspects over others. But there's no reason why we shouldn't do that too. And I think that getting rid of the internal border is a winnable demand. It's a winnable demand and it's one that we can you know, I think used quite strategically to try and build that consensus for open borders. Because, you know, there's a war of maneuver and there's war, the war of position. The war of maneuver is nothing without the war of position. And thinking about how you can bring new blocks, new cohorts, new demographics into genuinely radical politics, I think is the challenge we should all be meeting. Because, and believe you me, I love slagging off the Labour Party, right? Not a one of them can dress. Um, I could do it all day. Um, but that's not actually going to make our brand of radical politics get anywhere. And this is my beef with anarchos, is that we have 
evaded for so long the questions of scaling up. We've evaded for so long the question of changing people's minds. And what we filled that vacuum with was slagging off the Labour Party, which even for me gets boring <coughs> after a while. I've got this one, thank you. <laughs> no. God, the left and technology, we've got so many problems. Um, <laughs> where? Uh, so you partly answered my question that I was going to ask, but I'll open up to everyone else, which is, so clearly you, you're all aiming toward the point of we need to change the hegemony, right? We need to make it ours. And, I mean, how, how do we begin to do that? Storytelling is one part. But, I mean, how, how, do we, how do we even find a voice for that storytelling and a platform for it? Yeah, I mean, it's not going to be here. It's, um, it's going to be in, in meetings and places and encounters with people who are not like us or don't agree with us. Um, I'm going to give, give an example. I joined my Tenants and Residents Association <laughs> in uh, Bethnal Green kind of didn't work out. In, in my mind, I was like, this is it. We're going to organize around housing. It's, you know, we're going to, I'm going to be working with people from the local community. I've been here like a few years now. Um, yeah, I want to, you know, support people when, you know, really repressive housing legislation comes into force and people are going to start getting evicted. I'll do the groundwork now. And it was just really difficult. I was the only woman in the organization. And nobody really wanted to do any work. I like leafleted my whole estate. There was a sort of quite kind of, um, there was a sort of housing support officer who really had her own agenda. And she didn't want us to have our first meeting about housing. She wanted it to be about antisocial behavior because this was the big thing. And, and she really kind of dominated it. And we ended up having this meeting about ASB when really the, the actual kind of, nub of it was the lack of youth service provision in the area, that like 20 youth centres had been shut down. But instead we had um, people come along, kind of middle class guys, white guys, kind of complaining about Asian youth hanging around. And it, it, was really, it was really difficult. Um, the point I'm trying to make is that it was, a, it, was a, it was important to be part of that. It was important to see like, how you could be part of an organisation that is not part of the organised left, but you know, you've got access, you are part of a whole community and group of people that, that don't know each other and we all, we're all quite isolated and we're trying to organise around our community essentially and just recognising all these different power dynamics and rank dynamics and how, yeah, it's, it's hard work. Maybe I should try and give a positive story. <laughs> Union organising! Um, but yeah, I think that the work is going to be done in places where we, we are coming into contact with a lot of people who are um, not sharing our opinions, basically. And I know that's kind of, we all say that all the time. Um, but, you know, maybe trying to organize community forums. But then again, if it's coming from kind of middle class people who have the time and energy and the confidence to do that, will that create a kind of domination, um, unconscious domination of how the discourse develops? Um, I have to say that the door knocking around the general election was, was pretty transformative, I think, for a lot of people, because they, you know, I went round um, Croydon and Battersea and, I can't remember where else I went, but, um, you know, we were knocking on doors and talking to people who, you know, we were convincing people to vote for Labour, but it wasn't, it was more than that, it was the fact that we were going into housing estates and we were just having conversations with people on the doorstep and really having to kind of respond and react and listen, and it was, you know, multiple conversations like that all around the country where, you know, maybe people were talking about politics for the first time or were talking about politics in a way that they, they weren't able to in, in other contexts. And I know it has to go way beyond just the door knock and the election cycle. And Momentum, you know, has been doing a lot of good work around this, but a kind of parallel to this is community organizing. And one, one really positive story I will say um, is, a, is a group called the People's Empowerment Alliance for Custom House, Peach. I used to work for Peach. Oh, <laughs> do you know Hero? 
<laughs> yeah. So anyway, this, this is an organization that's been going for about four years. It's in the ward of Custom House, uh, which is facing um, Crossrail construction project finishing you know, next year. Um, most of the neighborhood is going to be bulldozed. It's going to be knocked down. And the plan from Newham Council is to engage a, a property developer to build basically one bedroom, unaffordable safety you know, deposit, financial deposits in the sky. Uh, the community will be moved on to Dover, to Birmingham. They'll, they'll be pushed out of Newham because, as the mayor of Newham said, if you can't afford to live in Newham, you can't afford to live in Newham. We'll get rid of him next year. But, so Peach has been working with architects to, to develop an alternative regeneration program and everything that goes into that, so housing, use of space, local economy, um, you know, parks, community centres, literally redesigning the neighbourhood with the community through door knocking, through meetings, through genuinely collaborative uh, consultation. And an alternative regeneration plan and model has been developed. And that's come from the community. That's come from grassroots organizing. And it's a positive alternative. Whether Newham Council will accept it or not is another story. But it's that kind of, it's exactly that kind of work that I think should be happening and can be happening because it's concrete, it's real, it's dealing with people's you know, immediate threat of being booted out of the neighbourhood. It's like 75, 80% social housing. It's a very poor neighbourhood. So this is, this is the kind of work. I think Peach is an excellent model for the sort of work that can be done. And I guess the renters union that's just set up is going to be trying to do that. Could you tell us a little bit about the renters union? So I think that's a huge issue which could, could radicalise, potentially swathes the people who aren't currently interested in labour or even politics, full stop. Yeah, the Renters Union is made up of various uh, organisations. Uh, Peach is part of it. Um, Unite Hotel Workers Branch is part of it. Help me out, someone. There are some other organisations that are part of it. I don't know if St Anne's Start is part of it. But anyway, it's a union. Uh, it's trying to be a union for people who are, are renting um, and who want to see their rent come down, who want to see affordable housing in their area, who want to challenge landlords and housing associations and uh, councils that are um, socially cleansing areas. And the model area for the renters' union at the moment, the focal point will be Newham, which is a hot spot. And they've got their first open organising meeting next Saturday. So you should all go along to it. Just go, just um, on Twitter, it's at LDN Renters Union. Someone here? Who's here is from the Renters Union? <laughs> next time, next time we meet. <laughs> you, all of you. Shout out my man, I'm from Skegness. Mika and Maya. Oh. Mika and Maya, so... Creating a fertile environment for radical left wing ideas. How do we do it? Um, I think one of the things, I guess, from a practical point of view that can be done, I know quite a few people who live in Sheffield, which is a Labour, I mean, it's a, yeah, <laughs> good, yeah, it's a Labour city. Um, and, but there are, like, there's obviously, as there are in many, um, towns and cities across the country, there are these pockets of real, real deprivation. And what you have in some of those spaces is, as the same story is um, across the country, is you have food banks, you have libraries um, closing down or being run by volunteers. And I know a lot of people who are doing work in those spaces, but who are not doing work in those spaces on behalf of the Labour Party. So if you're thinking about trying to reach people and talk to people who, um, you know, they hear a lot, they've heard a lot for the past 20 years about how a Labour government is maybe going to make their lives better, but we had a Labour government, it made their lives worse. Um, what can you do to reach them? I think a really, really easy thing you can do, and that is taking lessons from these histories, right? Something the Black Panthers did is providing free bre breakfast for children. Like, that's a really practical thing you can do to, as a community to look after one another, but also to show people what a radical politics can do. And I think getting in those spaces, as I think is being done in some places, um, but in a really cohesive way, having a strategy whereby those services, you have people from the left telling people, making what is already political, these spaces are already inherently political, but they're not overtly political to everyone who's visiting them. And I think making that clear is part of the way that you can say to people, we're not just going to say we're going to make your lives better. This is what we can do on a really small scale here. It would be, think about what we can do if we got in government. I think that's a really practical thing that can be done initially to reach some of those people who right now 
maybe don't think the Labour Party is going to actually change their lives at all. Yep, uh, some branches in London, like I think in Chingford, they're trying to do stuff with food banks, we're talking to people. But I think one of the challenges that they found there is how to do it in a way <clears throat> which isn't doing the Hamas model, like Hamas's model, is something that Labour branches have to do if they're going to be actively campaigning. Because if you're like me, involved in your local branch, it's so easy to get stuck in the bureaucracy. And it's so easy to get stuck on fighting off the right wing. Like, we're going to phone bank next week, and we're sending lots of messages this week, so we're going to have to pick a new secretary, and the right wing going to try and get the secretary instead of us. And that, takes, that, that can easily become the focus. And if that's what Labour branches end up getting stuck on, then, then we're not building that movement. Then we're not growing. We might be keeping power within the party, but we're not looking outwardly. <clears throat> However, Labour branches do have massive potential to look outwardly, and I think anyone who's engaged in community organizing in the past, if you think, well, okay, so my local, my branch, well, in my ward, actually, because <coughs> we're, so in my ward, <coughs> we've got 400 members, and there's 12,000 residents. So one in 30 residents is a Labour Party member. So that's a pretty good base to be organizing. And bear in mind, almost all of those members, 80 to 90% of those members joined for Corbyn. Now, our meetings have like 30 people in them. But lots of those 370 other people want to do, they don't want to come to meetings, especially if they think that it's just, you know, fighting the right. But they are, they see themselves as part of the left. They see themselves as wanting a big transformation. And finding ways to go, how do we organize locally um, in a way where it's not me as the chair telling people what to do, but it's about us sharing that power, growing that power, building that power. That's what we're going to need if we're going to have a radical left council taking over, a radical left Labour Party taking over, in my case, Waltham Forest, and pushing through radical stuff, otherwise we can't do that. Um, but the other question you asked before was about uh, stories and how, we, how do we smash the current neoliberal hegemony? How do we put something else in there? And we shouldn't forget that we're not the only ones trying to do that at the moment. Like, there's clearly a whole right-wing narrative on like, okay, how do we move beyond that? But also, there's a whole liberal soft left neoliberalism uh, like approach to neoliberalism as dying. Something else will have to take its place. I was at a conference today organized by a funder from one of my day jobs, and it's like, I don't know, 70 people, I think 69 white people, very, like, very proper. And, and they were all talking about what, how we're going to build a future beyond neoliberalism. They, 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 were they thought they were planning out how to do it. And like the keynote speaker was Matthew Taylor, who runs the RSA. In 2005, his job was to keep new labor in control of labor and to defend Tony Blair's reputation. And he was the keynote speaker in that context. Oh, we were into it before. It was cool. Just, <laughs> just make sure they know that. But we've got to win that. I think that's also the thing, like, if we want that post-neoliberal thing to not be fascist, not be liberal and shit. <laughs> um, so I've saved the best topic till last, which is Brexit. Didn't say I don't treat you all good. Um, obviously, that's a topic that we definitely need to change the narrative on, right? And in many ways, it's a really big space that the radical left needs to enter into, and especially if it's going to push Labour in the right direction, especially on freedom of movement. How do we even begin to do that? What is the narrative we need to be spinning around that topic? I know, Awa, you have done loads of really amazing work around workers' rights and what will happen to that after Brexit. I don't know if you could start off on that. I could. Um, <laughs> I also think um, Brexit... Um, offers us a really major opportunity. It's clearly um, exposed a lot of conflict. Um, class, I would argue, quite intense class conflict that was framed in terms of an anti-establishment narrative and in quite a uh, racist insider-outsider um, narrative which never spoke of um, British identity as being diverse, multicultural, the, the genuine sort of um, identity that it, that it is. It spoke of it in, in very nationalistic and white and uh, Christian values terms, and on the establishment's terms, you know, 
the Brexit referendum happened on the establishment's terms and people were sold um, a vote of power in a very, you know, in a binary question, yes or no, to a massive question that played into uh, all kinds of fantasies uh, of empowerment. And I think what it opened up was the possibility for a mass participation, you know, it was, it was a bigger turnout than general elections. Uh, it went beyond party, poli party political orientation. Um, and it also enabled a lot of people to speak about it with each other and speak to each other in the street. And I don't know how you all dealt with it, but when I was going out to pubs, I was like, how did you vote? You know, to complete strangers, <laughs> to try and open up conversation. In a way, that, that kind of breakthrough moment where everyone's talking about what they think and, and what they believe and what they want to see has passed. Um, but, and and the, the establishment has very much kind of claimed that narrative. I don't think Labour's necessarily um, reclaimed it enough towards a, I guess, a sort of, maybe they have towards a kind of workers' rights and social democratic agenda. But I think what's missing um, and what we could do um, as a radical left and, and people who know how to put on meetings and uh, organize socials is to basically have like community forums and forums where people are able to really discuss uh, what Brexit is going to mean for them and, and, yeah, and talk about how they voted and why and, and you know, listen to people who, who we absolutely do not feel we share any, any common ground with. But I think there's a lot of processing to be done around that vote and, and that choice and, and what it delved into. Um, so... I think it's that that, that Labour could possibly facilitate through Labour Party meetings, but then again, you know, that's a kind of, that's going to have an association with the political party. Basically, like, how do you get UKIP voters um, to, to not just vote Labour, and I know that happened, you know, for, for a large number in the last election, but how do you, you know, support, how do we support each other to, to end the reproduction of a you know white supremacist racism that is that is every day, and how do we have the conversations around no borders? You know, I don't think it's going to be through Twitter or Question Time or any of the main mainstream newspapers, and sadly, probably not through Navara. But you know, it's all the it's the work on the ground. Um, I don't think I'm saying anything new particularly, but. That's where I feel like I have my faith, because I did a lot of research around this topic for, for this chapter that I wrote for, uh, for The Many. Um, it's, it's a new book that's coming out. And I just found that everything about Brexit was so highly mediated through uh, people who already had political platforms, cultural platforms. There was so little qualitative response and um, opinion or, or access to, to really very, a very complex issue and, and how people were feeling about it. And I think maybe it's our job to like probe around that and use it, use this, you know, uh, our, our going out of the European Union to, to get out there and, and get people talking, have, you know, thousands of local meetings, more meetings, radical anarchism, more meetings. <laughs> we don't have enough endless conflictual meetings. <laughs> but I'm serious, that, that's what it needs to be. I am. <laughs> yeah. And no platforms like this. Sorry, guys, I love you, but like round, like proper, like everyone talking, have, having serious arguments, conflict, let's go into it, let's learn from it. There'll be a Q&A, so save your conflict for in about five minutes. Um, if the solution is more meetings, meetings, I will say you will never take me alive. You will never take me alive. I spent like age 18 to 21 doing that, and I realised that there's only so much hummus a bitch can eat. I ain't doing it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but what I will say on Brexit is that you said that that was an opportunity where people were talking to each other on the streets, and that was true. I was out on the streets the day after the referendum result came in, and for the first time in my life in London, I had people racially abusing me in the street in, like, Islington and, like, Whitechapel. Right. If you are racist to someone in those ends, usually it means you want to die. So a mood changed. A mood changed and, and I felt it. So f reading that as an opportunity, I'm a bit torn. Because on the one hand, it's awful. It's jarring. It's shit. And on the other, I always think about something that um, my mum said. Like, Mama Saka is getting enough shout-outs tonight. <laughs> Hold tight. Um, and I'm sure that if you're a person of colour, maybe your parents have said this a lot as well. 
which is, listen, at least with out and out racists, I know where I stand because the liberals are all thinking it anyway, but they won't even give me the dignity of a conflict. And so I think that's the moment where we are now, right? It's that you've got the dignity of the conflict, which means that we have to not just um, revive politics around Brexit. I think that we really have to revive an anti-racist politics, which is tied tightly to the politics of wealth redistribution. Because I wanted to talk a little bit about the corrosive effects that neoliberalism has had on social movements. One of the things was, I think, after the Scarman report, after the riots in um, the 1980s, was the institutionalization of anti-racism. It became about representation. It became about brown faces and high places, which meant that when the Race Relations Act comes through in 2000, you've got immigration officers being made exempt. Initially, the whole public sector was meant to be exempt until um, the uh, McPherson report came out. So I think that that shows us the dangers of not having a social movement and thinking about what a leftist response to Brexit will be without that rowdy, rambunctious and confrontational anti-racist social movement really does scare the living bejesus out of me because Britain is hella racist. That is one woke white person being like, I'm with you, sister. <laughs> Call me later, boo. Um, I think that one of the things that we can do, as well as renew that confrontational anti-racism, which makes white people uncomfortable, and uncomfortable white people don't vote to make themselves uncomfortable, is combine it, I think, with using this opportunity to pivot what Brexit might mean. Because right now, Lexit has to be the only game in town. Whether or not you want a referendum on the terms of the deal or whatever, I think that's actually a good idea. Lexit has to be the only game in town to use this as an opportunity to constitute a people versus power block, where you make it about working conditions, you make it about human rights. You also think about, yes, changes to immigration policy, like, you know, get rid of tier one and actually make it more equitable for all people. Actually, yeah, changes to immigration policy. You're right, you know, my racist, like, Donnie from Broxbourne. You're right, changes to immigration policy. Like, let's bring non EU migrants up to parity like you know I think that you have to start playing a game of sleight of hand and I think that the reason why that there's an opportunity for this right now and this is why we're talking about the politics of you know the immediacy we're not talking about the long durée anymore is because while the Tories are in charge you've got a perfect slogan which is you have flopped it mate you've completely shagged it right you had one job which was to negotiate this deal well and you fucked it up and in that gap I think you're right, is an opportunity. But that opportunity should be approached with, I think, a great deal of wariness. We should be a bit circumspect. And this is for, I think, you know, the, all five people of color in this room, is that we got a bit too comfortable on Twitter and we need to get more comfortable taking back the streets because that's what our parents did and their parents before them and that actually got shit done. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, firstly, I mean, everyone's sick of Brexit, right? Like, everyone is sick of hearing about it. Is it it's just me? I'm, My favourite topic. I, I, I think people are like, it, it was, to some extent, the dog that didn't really bark at the election, I think. Um, but I do think that the arguable opportunity it provides to the left is specifically on this migration issue. But the problem right now, and I'm going to be the... I'm going to be complaining about the Labour Party again, sorry, um, is that to have a workers' rights Brexit or workers' first Brexit, whatever the slogan is about having putting workers first with Brexit, is if you're going to get rid of freedom of movement, what are your policies that are going to go in place for that? Because if it is just about bringing EU migrants into the same system that non-EU migrants are in, what we actually know, what all the academic evidence shows, is that the, the visa system being tied, have to be, having to be tied to your employer having to be sponsored by your employer is really bad for workers' rights. It's really bad because you don't, you're le far less likely to want to challenge your employer if you know that they're also the person that is allowing you to stay in the country to some extent. There is tons of work on this that shows that. So I think the question, my big question for the left and for the Labour Party is, what are we going to do about that? If we're leaving the EU, if freedom of movement is ending, 
what does that mean in policy terms? Because we can talk about it rhetorically, we can, we can try to build narratives, which I think is also crucial. And I think we haven't seen that enough from, from Labour. We haven't seen them shifting the rhetorical ground, trying to build some of these stories about migration. We saw it to some extent in the leaked version of the manifesto. There were some quite nice lines in there um, about contributions of migrants to the country. And there was none of the getting rid of freedom of movement stuff, but that, that did shift with the manifesto that it was had the official Labour Party stamp on it. And I assume that is because of the tensions within the shadow cabinet over this very issue. But the question remains is if we're going to have a workers' rights Brexit, if we're going to put workers first, if it's just British workers, people who have British passports, you can count me out because I don't, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not in for that. And I think a lot of people on the left are not going to be in for that. So we have to start having that conversation. And when I was talking earlier about pushing the Labour Party, it's on these very issues. This is really tricky political ground for them. We know that. We know how deeply entrenched anti-migrant sentiment is in the country. But coming with sh alongside shifting the narrative has to be shifting the policy because those policies have tangible effects on people's lives. People's lives right now are being shaped by those policies. People are not with, able to have their children in the same country as them. They're not able to live with the person that they love. They're having to show their passports to, to get... Um, medical treatment in A&E. Like, that's not a, a life anyone should have to live. And thinking about the effect of those policies when people are in their jobs, I think is really, really important for the Labour Party to address that if we're going to have a Brexit that actually cares about all workers. Um, obviously, I agree. Um. <laughs> Um, I think we need to not get stuck on talking about it as Brexit. I don't think the argument that we need to win is about Brexit. Um, I mean, the argument we need to win is about migration because I, like, we, we, we have to win the argument within Labour in terms of what would go into a manifesto, but that's just like the Labour leadership and the union leaderships. We've also got to win it within Labour as a whole. Like, we have that argument... Well, not in my branch. We want it in the branch. We have it within momentum in Walthamstow. And we need to win it there, and we need to win it in Labour across country, and we need to win it in the country. Because while we're stuck on, on Brexit, just as Brexit, then we don't actually get to win the argument on, on migration. And that's the fundamental thing, because it's still going to be an issue after Brexit or Brexit or whatever comes. And so, we, yeah, we need to have that mobilisation Mobilization. Interestingly, the thing you said about having local meetings, the thing ever said about, uh, about having local meetings, so Labour and Walthamstow did have lots of meetings. They were run by Stella Creasy, who, who has that, is shit, like she's our MP. But she did have lots of MPs where people came, uh, sorry, she had lots of meetings where people came along and talked about, and lots of EU migrants especially came along and talked about how it was what Brexit meant for them and about how they were now experiencing racism as Polish people, which they hadn't experienced before. And that was interesting in terms of going, okay, here's a generally shit rightish, softish, soft leftish MP who is doing some of the useful community organizing stuff. But her public narratives on Brexit are quite unhelpful because even though she's saying some good stuff on migration, she's tacking it onto a, she's not actually focusing on winning that argument, she's focusing on winning a Brexit argument. Thank you, everyone. So we're going to open it out to the audience now for some questions. Does anybody have a question? Put your hand up. Uh, First, like, women as well, please. Question, I have like, men and women <laughs> questions. Uh, can I start with this gentleman here on the front? Uh, this, this gentleman here with the... Yeah, he's like making hand gestures at you. I'm coming. I think we're going to have to buy some wireless uh, mics next time. Oh, here you are. Now to fix the mics. Where have you been? Hi. Uh, thank you for the great panel discussion. Um, you talked a little bit about um, building a more kind of radical vision on migration policy um, and on uh, prison abolition. Um, and I just wondered if any of the panel had any thoughts on um, building a more kind of radical economic policy. Um, and what could be replacing neoliberalism? Because at the moment it seems to be kind of a redredged Keynesianism in a way. Um, John McDonald's kind of plan for 
Labour, um, Britain under Labour, would be to um, borrow money to grow the economy. Um, and I just wondered if you had any thoughts of what that might mean in terms of um, the climate, in terms of um, just kind of the, the, the approach that growth economics might have to kind of our broader um, biosystem. Um, science tells us that um, to prevent um, two degrees of warming, we need to be um, reducing emissions by 10% every year um, since 2015. That's not possible in, um, in, a, in a growth economy. So I just wanted to give you any thoughts on that. Mika, would you like to start off? Is it just one question? Uh, let's do saying? one and then we'll... Or do you want to do... Yeah, we'll do... Let's do yeah. one and then we can... Um, I think Labour's trying to grapple, trying to work out... I mean, specifically John McDonnell and the Shadow Cabinet are trying to work out how to... how to combine uh, shifting our economy, um, part largely by borrowing money and by driving investment with rapid climate um, targets. I agree it's a challenge. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> I think we're unlikely to hit pretty much without um, just basically slashing consumption and driving. The, the most effective way to hit 10% every year um, would be to force country through something similar to what happened in the Soviet Union in 1990. Like that is the only comparative um, place that I've seen where emissions have gone jum, 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 jum at that speed. I don't think that's on the agenda for anyone, <laughs> including the radical left. Really? They were there. Um, however, um, just last week, John McDonnell was talking about putting climate stuff into the, the OBR's assessments and the work that we're doing for them on, which is primarily on energy, um, does build in pretty dramatic um, shifts in terms of our emissions. I don't think we'll hit 10% every year. What we're working on does still include growth. Um, one issue that we're not resolving is the fact that people are still going to, including me, are still going to keep buying stuff that's made in China. And that's still going to lead that way. Like, that's a largely unresolvable thing with our economic, with, with Labour's current visions for a different economy. Um, if anyone has any solutions on how we, but, you know, I guess local autarky and separating ourselves off more from the global economy would be. I mean, here's um, where I think the Labour Party as a vehicle for pushing a more radical narrative is very limited. And I think that this is where um, more um, insurrectionist forms of politics, shall we say, come in handy. Um, it's kind of funny that you mentioned like global supply chains. I'm taking my uh, students on a trip to like Port of Rotterdam in a couple of weeks because it's just this immense like sprawl for like dozens and do dozens of kilometers and it's largely automated. So it's kind of this giant game of Tetris like, you know, along the Netherlands coast. And the reason why I'm taking them there is to start thinking about how the way in which global capital works is not the way that we imagine it. So we've been talking a lot about containing our discussions of the death of neoliberalism to one country. And that's not how sovereignty works anymore, cuz. Like, you know, global capital done been happened. And with that comes a great sense of powerlessness, sure, right? When the face of global capital doesn't have a face, right? It's corporate power. Um, and you don't necessarily have a government to leverage yourself against, then what do you do? But then there is a great deal of vulnerability at these strategic points in global supply chains, and you've seen it in places, so in uh, worker struggles in Bangladesh or indeed in China. Um, there was a, a strike at distribution center uh, November before last in which a striker was killed by a car um, like going through the picket line. Um, on the anniversary of his death, there were further strikes and disruptions of these quite strategic points. I don't think you can have an electoral vehicle that can harness that energy. But you can have an electoral vehicle with a well-placed leadership to respond to that energy, right? But again, this comes from, um, you know, this is the great development of autonomous politics, is that if we don't do it, no one will, and that's the shit that needs to be done. 
Yeah, I'm agreeing with what people have been saying. Um, I think there needs to, as I was saying before, the repeal of the anti-union laws, having legislation passed by Labour which enables um, organised workers and communities to push for much more from below is going to be, necess is going to be necessary to create an alternative economic model from below. Um, stopping certain... Um, dynamics from progressing, such as academization, privatize, all, all kinds of privatization, um, and putting a cap on, well, preventing fracking from happening and, and stopping um, major energy companies from extracting, and, and actually, as Miko was saying, but also kind of holding them liable for their emissions, for all, all corporations for their emissions within the entire supply chain needs to happen. But these are, in a way, there's going to have to be quite a lot of punitive measures and repressive measures in terms of the growth of capital um, instituted by the Labour Party when they get into power. And the kind of model that, that I think could emerge, and every time I think about this, it kind of, it does kind of come back to quite a national or um, kind of UK-based, locally-based way of organising. I mentioned Peach and the organizing that they're doing to um, become a community, to, to enable Custom House to become a community land trust, um, for the housing to uh, belong to the community and for that accountability to be there. For that to happen, you, you kind of need communities. <laughs> and, and Custom House might be um, rare now in the sense of it being, you know, having been a kind of sink estate where you have people living um, homeless, like homeless tenants and social tenants in one place for a long period of time where every, where in so many other areas of London you've just got so much, and around the country you've got quite a lot of circulation and movement of people so it's quite hard to even organise in your locality and I know that economic change, maybe it doesn't have to happen between people in one fixed geographical locality when we're talking about taking back the city, etc. But I also don't know how else it can happen. <laughs> if we really believe in it coming from below, people have to have those relationships and uh, respons collective responsibility backed and supported by um, a radical council to make that happen. Um, I'm not sure, I feel like home and housing and you know, local organizing is so important to have, to, to build on, on having an alternative economy that, yeah, <laughs> I don't know how the, you know, the macro aspects are going to basically be kind of social democratic, aren't they? Like banning tuition fees, stopping privatization of the NHS, stopping academization, sequestering land, probably subsidizing farmers, subsidizing community controlled energy, nationalizing the energy grid and companies. I mean, just the sheer uh, compensation that, that is going to have to be paid to all these companies because their contracts will be broken. Um, it's going to be massive. Uh, yeah. Oh, Mika. <laughs> no? We don't have to pay them that much money. I mean, <coughs> we've, we've given them so much over the years. I don't think they deserve anything, <laughs> but, like, structurally, it's probably... Is it, isn't it going to be like that in terms of treaties and trade deals and... For the nationalising? So I think... We'll have to pay some. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Pay it. Fuck it. It's going to be ours. <laughs> no, this is exactly what we want in this panel. I mean, the main reason we'll actually have to pay a significant chunk for them, the main reason we'll have to pay a significant chunk for buying them is that if we don't do that, then a lot of people's pensions will get fucked. Actually, probably less than international trade. Like, I don't know, let, let's, like Centrica, <coughs> British Gas, if we nationalise them, at least nationalise the bit of them that sells us all electricity and gas, 1% of Centrica is owned by the Greater Manchester Pension Fund. Those are council workers in Manchester who don't earn very much, whose pension is in it. So probably it wouldn't actually impact their pensions. Probably it would mean Greater Manchester Combined Authority would have to put in more money to cover their pensions. <clears throat> but that, that's probably ultimately going to be the, those things are going to be what force us to pay more rather than less for the companies as long as we keep paying off the loans that they had. I mean, on, on the specifics, what we'll, we nationalize shit, and then we'll, we'll, we'll buy, we'll pay the shareholders a certain amount, but those companies have got lots and lots of debt. Now, if we don't keep paying that debt, then the UK's credit rating goes to the fuck and we can't borrow money. So that, that's where we're gonna have to keep.
You've made pensions sound very scurrilous. Pension, <laughs> pensions are crucial. Pensions never been so exciting. <laughs> uh, yeah, just really quickly on this on this issue of climate change, I think it kind of brings together what we've been talking about in relation to migration as well, because what we're going to see, regardless of what happens um, with climate change in terms of countries meeting their targets, we are going to see more pe people have to move. Like, that is just going to happen. And we, as a country, are in no way significantly prepared in terms of our rhetoric, in but also in terms of our policies, for what that means. If you think now the borders of Europe are violent and bloody and racist, get ready for what's going to happen when the effects of climate change, they're beginning to hit, they already are, but when it intensifies. And actually, what's really interesting for this, for thinking about the Labour Party, and this is where I agree with Ash that we need to think outside of the Labour Party for this, it's because I think it's too politically difficult for them, it's something they're not going to do. But what Rhys Jones talks about in his book, Violent Borders, is the fact that the privileging the nation state is our problem here. I mean, the nation state has many problems in general, but in thinking about migration, Gary Young talked about how migration is age old, right? But the nation state is a relatively new concept. That is not something we're very plugged into, the way we talk in our contemporary politics. Even the way we talk, I think, in some of our activist circles. And I think remembering that, remembering what Rhys Jones talks about in this book is that because the nation state is privileged, it means it's incredibly difficult to to force any country to meet their targets. That's not happening. Because we use the UN as a vehicle for trying to achieve some kind of change, I mean, it privileges the nation state. That's what the UN is built to do. That's how the UN works. So actually, I think we should be having some really dynamic conversations using some of this work that's already out there to begin to think, OK, if we actually want to have a life on this planet, if we actually want to take climate change seriously, we've got a whole different conversation to be having outside of the conversation we're having about our national politics and that should be happening alongside I think I think it's crucial that it does because if we get so bogged down in what is going on within our own country that's never going to happen thank you sorry um, two more questions let me see hands uh, someone over here in a in, what, it looks like a grey sweatshirt Pink, sorry, it's pink. It's a millennial pink. Um, yeah, so Eva mentioned housing earlier, and I think, well, generally housing, I think, is one of the main antagonisms at the moment, not just in London, but across the country. Um, but it's got, like, a bit of a um, fraught relationship with Labour, because, at least in London, a lot of the struggles that are happening are against Labour councils, so, like, for example, the HTV, like, up in Haringey, that's a Labour Council pushing that through, which is probably going to be, I think it's, like, 5,000 um, homes are going to be sold off. Um, so, yeah, I think, um, like, how do you, like, you know, is the housing movement forever going to be organising outside of the Labour Party? Like, I'm just curious like what people think like whether you can actually like influence this policy um from within it um because you know i don't know if labor is going uh so you know i'm i'm involved with the uh london renters union for example like i don't know if labor is going to support that um i think it will have support within communities in the area for example newham but, you know, it's, it's difficult to see the Labour Party supporting something like rent strikes, which is one of the only ways that we can really leverage power over landlords at the moment. Um, so, yeah, and also, like, in the Labour manifesto this year, there was very little to offer on housing, um, which makes me wonder, like, whose interest is it in? Like, are they on the side of tenants or... I don't know. Um... So, yeah, I guess and my question, like, yeah, do you think any of that can be um, in Labour? And then one more question. Maybe this gentleman over here, the, like the middle of the road. Do you want to put your hands up again? Uh, it's like a blue guy with a blue T-shirt. You had your hands up on the second... You put your hand down. You don't want to ask your question anymore. This guy over here. Hi. Yeah, 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 just over there, like a blue-collared shirt and jumper. 
the really smart guy, yeah. smarter than everyone else in the room. Right. Um, I just wanted to build on the lady's point who just spoke a minute ago. Um, I was so uh, uh, passionate about this issue that I was up at 4 a.m. talking to a family member about it, um, and I was late for work. Um, but I think this is precisely where the extra parliamentary left um, have to stay as the extra parliamentary left, um, as well as doing what they're doing in the Labour Party, because one of the things that's really concerning me at the moment is this plucking figures out of the air as to how many houses we need to build, 600,000, 400,000, whatever it is. And I think one of the most important things that the extra parliamentary left can do is to use the freedom we have to uh, make our demands very, very clear. And I think the point I wanted to make specifically was about Grenfell. I don't think we're going to... Um, the, the, the legacy that Labour have to, have to leave is something that 50 years later, or 50 years from now, people can look back and say, this is the settlement that the Labour government achieved. And what we don't need is more um, council houses, granite council houses, with sprinklers and saying we built more houses. We need to build social housing, and, and the extra parliamentary left need to demand this. We need to build social housing of such a standard that people who come to Britain say this is how a, a Labour government treats its people. And 50 years later from now, people, can, uh, people look back and say, do you know, in this period of time, social housing was of such a standard that it was comparable even to private housing or even better. And that's the kind of thing that the extra parliamentary left house it at the renters' union, um, other housing um, organisations who are outside the Labour Party need to demand. It needs to be very clear about it. It's not a shameful demand. People who lived in Grenfell should have been housed in much better conditions than that, not concrete monoliths with extra sprinklers. It should be proper five-star luxury hotel style, style housing. That's what we need. And we can afford it. And we should do it. I agree completely. I think, I mean, this is why we love throwing this phrase around, nothing's too good for the working class. One of the, the reasons why I'm not a liberal is because I think it's appalling that to live a good life is pinned to something so arbitrary and meaningless as money. Like, that's, that's why I'm a leftist. And on this issue of housing and thinking about what it can look like, what it can be like, I know you spoke against concrete monoliths, but I do love a little bit of a concrete monolith. Um, I, was in, I was in Marseille um, to watch the football, nothing political to see Marseille saint Etienne. And on my way to the stadium, went, stopped off at uh, Cité Radieuse, which is the estate built by Le Corbusier. And it was a beautiful kind of late spring day and the concrete was kind of warmed up and you just, your eye got drawn to these beautiful details, like a bit of wood panelling, like in the windows or the way in which that they'd painted the kind of inner walls and the balconies different colours so it looked like a giant Mondrian. And so you think that the architectural history that we have in this country is very particular and that it's always been very small C conservative. It's always kind of upheld a norm of kind of, you know, an Englishman wants like a little cottage even if it's like in Hackney Wick. Um, and whereas actually there's some quite beautiful models of mass housing that are out there. On this issue of Grenfell, it disgusts me to see a politician like Philip Hammond even let the name Grenfell leave his lips during the budget when we know that he's pursuing policies which produce the conditions that could let a tragedy like Grenfell happen. And I think that it is a stain on us as the extra parliamentary left or indeed the parliamentary left that we didn't bring down a government over it. And I think we need to think about why that was. And I think that one of the major reasons is because we looked at the form of organizing that was going on, which was about taking to the streets was also about going to like meeting after meeting after meeting and we chased the media cycle and dissipated with it and I think that that shows us just how much we've lost our way on what it means to create a antagonistic activist culture that is also sustainable. I think 
what the extra parliamentary left and how the parliamentary left can, I think, dovetail it on this issue of housing and to move beyond what you identified, which is the arbitrary kind of, you know, numbers which get so big that they become meaningless to the rest of us. Like, what's the difference to 100,000, 200,000? I'm an English literature student, so I've got no fucking idea. Um, one of the things that I think we should look to is get rid of the repressive anti-squatting legislation, which means that you can't have a housing movement the way you've seen it in Barcelona or the way in which you've seen it in Madrid. You've got vast housing stocks, particularly in London, but also in Manchester, also in Leeds, also in Leicester, which are empty, and that's disgusting. I think the other thing that we need to make it easier to do, or sorry, um, more difficult to do is to turn houses which are meant for multiple occupancy, like multiple flats, um, make it more difficult to turn it back in single houses. It's what landlords are doing because it's, you know, a kind of unsexy change in planning legislation, which meant that housing, which should be providing homes for multiple families, is just a shell for capital. We need to think about what the demand for decommodify housing actually is and thinking about how we pursue that from both a antagonistic, non, uh, extra parliamentary perspective and also what legislative wins would look like. Because I think you're right. I think Grenfell should be um, the symbol that we lift up as a never again on the left. And it frustrates me that we're not doing that. Anybody else like to take on the issue of it, it, does Labour have housing in its it, in its sites, in its interests? I mean, the, I think a lot has been covered. The one thing that I, just going back to the, the original first question, that I do want to just touch upon is, I live in Newham. Um, you walk down Stratford High Street and you still see the campaigners, right, who were, the council was just trying to turf... Um, working class people out of council houses to basically flatten the area and bring in a load of, they said this, bring in more middle, more middle class people, get rid of the working class people out of the borough. And you still see people on the high street campaigning on this issue and they explicitly have signs saying, if you are anything to do with the Labour Party, do not come anywhere near us. Their experience has been so atrocious with the Labour Council, with Robin Wales as mayor, that they want nothing to do with the Labour Party. And I think that really needs to be respected in spaces up and down the country where this has happened. Um, and I think the Labour Party, when those councils are, you know, when those people are turfed out, if the left manages to win power in some of these spaces, always keeping my fingers crossed for Newham to get rid of Robin Wales. Let's hope that does happen next year. Um, Newham Spring, baby. Yeah, we can only hope. Uh, but... When that does happen, I think the people who come into those positions need to realise and need to be really plugged into the local politics and recognise that those people are not suddenly going to just change, change their minds because there's a, no, a different person in that senior position. Because they've heard these things, as I said before, they've heard these things from the Labour Party, they've heard false promises made, and I think it is un incumbent upon those Labour councils to then learn and just listen to those organisations, right? Because they're going to continue doing their campaigning, they're going to continue making their demands, and I think that there needs to just be a level of response from a Labour council when we win power back in those spaces. Uh, specifically on the thing about HTV and Tottenham, I think we... like. We always have to ask ourselves, who is the Labour Party? Who are we talking about when we say Labour? Because Labour can mean Jeremy Corbyn. It can mean Labour HQ, which is largely still the same people that were working there before Jeremy Corbyn. It could mean your local council. In Tottenham, it could mean local council. It could mean the people who run the CLP, who are all on the hard left. Or it could mean the thousands and thousands and thousands of local members. Most of them have never gone to a meeting. And for me, that's really important because I think HDV in, in Newham, sorry, HDV in Haringey could have been stopped. And I think the main thing that ha has meant that we might not stop it, although I'm not sure exactly what's happened with the council selections, is that we not quite enough left members showed up to councillor selection meetings. Like, that's fundamentally the thing that could have stopped it. If a couple more of those thousand people... Has it turned? Okay. Okay, well, then we're fine. By one. Great. Perfect. Well, there we go. But, so that's why it comes down to those couple people showing up to those meetings. And, they and does that mean that HTV will be stopped? No, but, like, quite probably. Okay. 
Well, there we go. The new leftists in there. So you can always rely on Tottenham to show up. Like, <laughs> yeah. <like that>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yay! <laughs> um, I mean, Labour has also committed to ballots on housing estates at the last conference. Um, and I interviewed David Blunkett about ballots because it's something that radical councils used to do in the 80s. They'd have ballots on, like, do you want your kids to wear school uniforms? And what he said was the lesson he learned from doing them back in the day was you can't just be like, yes or no. Mm. You have to have months of meetings and consultation and education where you say, hey, we might need to regenerate this estate. This is a choice for you. This is how much it costs to redo it. This is how much it costs to get a refurb. This is how much it costs to get a new one. These are all the various moving parts of it. We respect you enough to make a decision with all of this information. Um, so I think it goes back to what you were saying about you've got to have meetings and you've got to include people. It can't just be sort of referendum style voting because... Yeah, and also it's not that I'm opposed to like radical direct action and, and direct action in the streets and shutting shit down. That, that has to happen, but it's a question of who's doing it and how do we get people confident enough who are not the usual suspects or you know, people who um, it's, for, it's threatening for them to do that. Maybe they're undocumented. You know, maybe you know, they're, they're suffering at the hands of the police already and it's really risky to, to come into contact with that, but, but maybe not. Like just on Grenfell, um, I, went to Gren I went down there like a few days after the, the massacre and there was quite a few activists that got together through Radical Housing Network to, to meet, to talk about how to support the local community. And what, what really transpired from that process was just how the people from the Grenfell Action Group were in severe mourning and they didn't want anyone to speak for them and they didn't want anyone to represent them. They really just wanted some time and they'd lost you know, a lot of loved ones, they'd lost, peop they'd lost members of the group and it kind of felt like what we, what we had to do was just kind of wait, in fact. I mean, I know some people went, like, community did go out and, and protest, and they did it in, in quite a spontaneous and organic and local way, which was amazing, and, and that was necessary. But then there, were, there was also, like, SWP coming in and trying to kind of get involved, and even, like, Movement for Justice did their march and their demo, and that wasn't well received by, by people in the community. They didn't want that. They didn't want people... Um, speaking for them and, and co-opting their grief, even though the grief was felt by so many people. And even, now, and even within the community itself, there were people coming and speaking who, who were not really, the, you know, not really like, authorized by the local community to do that. Some people you know, had been there for a very long time, and, and so this entire kind of struggle around co-optation of voice and um, you know, trying to, to mine this uh, ex experience and this horror for, for a political purpose when really it was so important for the community and the people most directly affected to lead, but it was just, there was so much trauma. Um, and it's something that we should think about and learn from. And I, f I felt like the thing we did learn was, like, I just went around with a local community filmmaker and just held the mic, <laughs> held the mic for lots of people, shut my mouth, didn't write anything, didn't really say very much, because it's, it's not, I just really felt like it wasn't necessary. It was important to literally give the mic to, to people who needed it. And, and to, be, to be ready, to be ready, like, and, and be of service when, when the people are asking you to, to do that and to know what you can offer that's not substituting what, what people are going to want to offer themselves. So just to sort of comment on like responses to that. So maybe a little democracy now. We've got maybe time for one more question or if you're all really knackered of listening, we could just go to the bar. How do people feel? Question or bar? Okay, bar. Yeah, yeah, head it. Head it loud and clear. Um, thank you so much. So there's merch stands outside as well if you want to get some wavy Navara merch. Um, um, okay, so uh, not tomorrow, but Friday after, Friday the 8th, Navara Media having a Christmas party. Come, get wavy, cop your tickets, wear your crispy garms, get a bit drunk. Do a bit of chirp sing. <laughs> I'm just going to leave it there. Sold me. I'm there. Um, but details on Navarra Media Facebook. 
Um, tickets are excessively reasonably priced, if I may say so myself. And yeah, come, turn up. Like, we're trying to institute the People's Republic of Banter here, and we can't do it without you. Done? Done, right, see you in the bar. Thank you.